It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Uh, looking forward to what he's got for us in the word. I'm going to open it up and listen to hear, hear what the Lord has to say to us. Uh, I'm just looking forward to it. Uh, and it's been a good week. The Lord has helped us. He's helped us to get done what we needed to get done. And I am excited about what he is going to do. I, uh, I, I just know he's moving. He opened up doors for me today. And uh, I'm thankful I was able to step through one. And so um, just praying that the Lord will open up an amazing window of blessing on your life in the realm of soul winning and, and just see God do great things. To the Lord in prayer tonight as we uh, open this service. I'm asking to touch the number of needs that are here to, uh, that we have. Uh, we're going to pray for uh, Jacob and Haley's cousin Jennifer. As she has COVID, ask God to touch her. Also, uh, my boss has had a, a, a strange case of COVID. Ask that you would pray for him. His name is Chris. Don't pray for Chris. That God will touch him. Um, and uh, let's just continue to pray. The Lord's opening up place things. Just, I believe he's about to do something incredible and, uh, in our church in the world of harvest. And let's pray that God will do those very things. Uh, how many of you have a need that you'd like to make mention of tonight? I do. Yes. Christy Sims, uh, my good friend for years, she's the one that had the cancer years ago, mm -hmm. and the five adopted kids, mm -hmm. and uh, she went back to, she, her and her daughter, and the two younger girls, went back to MD Anderson out in Houston, Texas, for her regular checkup, they left Monday morning, mm -hmm. her and her daughter's going to split the day, so just pray that she got a good report, and they yes. got back safe. Absolutely, we'll do that. She's been doing really good. Yes, we will pray. The Lord blessed that lady. Yes, He did. It was Him that brought her out of it. I remember that. Uh, <coughs> and also, <coughs> we have um, AYC coming up. And Lord, and I'll bring you and Becky. It's coming up. Don't touch that. stand here tonight and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let me hear you pray tonight. I'm not asking you to pray like I pray, but I would like to hear your voice that's here tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us with your power and your strength, oh God. Thank you, Lord, for the chance, God, that you've given us, oh Lord, to be in your presence tonight. Thank you so much for your blessings, Lord. I, every day, God, you have done a tremendous work, O oh Lord, for me, and I thank you for that. God, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for this congregation, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for these people that have a heart to serve you, O oh God, that their lives are demonstrating, Lord Jesus, the things that are of you, God, and Lord Jesus, you have ordained for us, O oh God. Lord, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for this group, O oh Lord. Because, oh God, in this end time, you have raised up us, oh God, to do your work, oh Lord. And that, God, your work would be, Lord Jesus, not done by others, but by us, oh God. We are laborers in your kingdom, oh God. Lord, I call on you tonight to open up doors for us, God, to make ways, oh Lord Jesus, to touch lives through us, oh God. And that, Lord, we would be a blessing to the kingdom of God. I ask tonight, Lord Jesus, that there would be a miraculous delivery of this thing, O oh God. Lord Jesus, fill this sanctuary with people. Fill this sanctuary with those, Lord, that have never heard, O oh God. Fill this sanctuary with those, Lord Jesus, that have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, O oh God. Lord Jesus, that need discipling, God, I pray, Lord, that you would send us further laborers, O oh God. Lord Jesus, I pray, God, that your hand would move in this congregation, Lord. Touch old friends, God, that haven't been in a while. God, I pray that your hand would touch their lives and draw them back to this place, oh God. 
Lord, I pray that you would touch the many needs, God, of this congregation. Touch Josh. God, I ask you, Lord, to move in his body. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to heal him, Lord, with your mighty hand. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would move and touch Chris. God, strengthen him, Lord. Touch Jennifer. God, I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would send healing, God, to her body. Lord, I ask you, Lord Jesus, not only to touch Jennifer Parker, but, Lord, touch uh, J uh, Jacob's uh, cousin, Lord Jennifer. Lord, I ask you to heal her, God. I ask you, Lord, to move and to touch in her body. God, I ask you, Lord Jesus, to touch Christy. Lord, I pray, God, that you would touch all of the families of this congregation. Let your anointing flow, God, and let your power be known, oh God. Lord Jesus, touch this place, God. Touch the unspoken needs of this congregation. Touch us, O oh Lord, and draw us to you, God. I ask that you would touch a work situation. For Benjamin, oh God, I ask you, Lord Jesus, to touch and move, Lord, in the, in the AYC meeting that's coming up, oh God. I pray, Lord, that your hand would move, Lord, in our lives and that you would help us, oh God. Grace us with your presence. Grace us with your glory. Lord, I give you praise, Lord, for all that you've done, God. In your precious and holy name, I pray. Amen and amen. And you may be seated here tonight. And it is good to have all of you in the house. And today, I somehow, I don't know how it happened, but somehow our youngest is 21 years old today. It can't be possible because I can't be a day over 29 years old myself, <laughs> but, but, uh, but nevertheless, it's Benjamin's 21st birthday, happy birthday, Benjamin. I would like to remind you of the cards that are on the, the guest station outside. Please pick one of those up. Keep it with you. Put it in a place that you will see it on a daily basis, if not more than daily basis. It is our mission this year to see God do great things. And not just see God do great things through others, but see God do great things through us. And I am believing that God is releasing uh, the mention of growth and harvest in your mission field this year. I am praying that way. I am going to see God do an amazing work in this church this year. If you have your Bibles, stay seated, but turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14. 2 Timothy 2 and 14. Bible says this, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but the, to the subverting of the hearers. And I want you to understand, I didn't include this in my notes, uh, and for those of you who have been with us for a little while, you'll understand what I'm about to say. Uh, this should have been the beginning of another chapter. This is the beginning of a new thought. And uh, Paul finished uh, the previous thought uh, with verse 13. Verse 14 is a completely different, uh, it should have been, as I said, a, a different chapter. Nevertheless, we push along here tonight. It was that one afternoon in in February of 2011 that seven researchers from the University of Irvine, of California at Irvine, uh, began to talk to a man by the name of Frank Healy. Uh, he is at that time, or was at the time, 50-year-old visitor from South Jersey, and they took turns quizzing him on his extraordinary memory. It was their that the author of the paper tape recorded the conversation as someone tossed out a random date in his life. They tossed out the day of December 17, 1999, some many years before the meeting that I speak of. Okay, Healy replied, well, September the 17th, 1999, the jazz great Grover Washington died while playing a concert. What did you have for breakfast, they asked him. 
He said special K for breakfast. I had liverwurst and cheese for lunch. And I remember the song You Got Personality was playing on the radio as I pulled up for work. He said about his day that he had not been prepped for those many years before. He is one of 50 confirmed people in the United States with what's called highly superior autobiographical memory, this uncanny ability to remember dates and events. And he said about that day that he remembers walking into work and one of the clients was singing a parody of Jingle Bells that said, oh, what fun it is to ride in a beat-up Chevrolet. And Healy is one of about 60 or 70 that they have identified in, in the United States and up to about 2017 who has this HSAM, as it's called. And in his life, you can name a date and he can just tell you details about that day that he has. And he can, and it's, they're verifiable facts. It's not that he's making these things up. And yet, with such a profoundly good memory, it can still be faulty. And it was in testing that they began to test people of this nature that uh, something interesting happened. When there was a recall of things that they had been told, uh, they remembered with the same sort of accuracy that everyone else has. And by the way, your memory is not very. And most of us are like that. My wife is one of these that perhaps has HSAM because she can remember details about life that I, frankly, she can recall details about her life. And this is no, no exaggeration that when she was two and three years old. I remember the first thing that I remember, I was about four or five years old. And the only reason I remember it is because I had fallen and hurt, my, hurt myself and another time my mother ran over a dog and that's the earliest memories that I recall in my life. I don't recall maybe I'm just not the brightest bulb in the bunch which is probably the truth but I just don't have that sort of recall. It, it started bothering me some years ago to be honest with you and so I am trying to remember what I did. I started not a diary but I started a time interval thing. I would write down and look at I did this for more than over, I did it for a year or two. And every day I would go in and just write a note about what I had done, where I had been, and all of these sort of things because it bothered me that I couldn't remember hardly what I ate for breakfast last Monday morning. And if you're asking, I don't remember what I ate for breakfast last Monday morning. And so, uh, but there in a nearby office, you can find Professor Loftus, who has spent decades researching how memories can become contaminated with people remembering. Sometimes, quite vividly and confidently, they remember things that never really happened. Anybody here ever been in that place where you know somebody that they are like, oh yes, I was there when JFK was shot, and they're like 13 years old, and you're like... No, 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 no. It really didn't happen. You weren't old enough. You remember the movie about that, but you don't remember the actual occurrence. And so there are times in which we believe things that are vivid, and yet they are absolutely faulty. In fact, in courts today, um, testimony of things is quite often proven to be not the case. And so... Thus it is that whenever you're instructed and whenever you're a witness, they tell you to only say yes and no and don't ever get engaged in the, in the description of what you think that you remember happening that day. Loftus, Professor, Professor Loftus has found that memories can be planted in someone's mind if they're exposed to misinformation after an event or if they are asked suggestive questions, this is important, about the past. And, and one famous case, in fact, was that of Gary Ramona. Gary, who sued his daughter's therapist. Listen, this is crazy how, how, how much this can get us into trouble. Because his daughter's therapist 
planted false memories in her mind that her dad had raped her. And thus he had to sue for the truth, and that was that he had never done so. It is important for us to understand that there are things that we think we remember that are not, in fact, at all what we remember at all. We're very open to suggestion. And so Paul walks into this next phase of his directions to Timothy by one of the few ways that our memories are corrected and kept in this passage. And that is with words. It is about words, the meaning of those words, the value of those words, and the consequences of those words. And so, as we pick up pillar and buttress again, we are going to deal with the destruction of words that are twisted and misremembered and forgotten and yet re-implanted in our minds in a way that suggests that we know what happened when indeed we did not. And so it's sort of like those things. Paul has spent some time in the previous verses singing a song. All of us can remember the songs, though. We may not be able to remember specific things, but when I begin to sing a song, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me. I, I, I can, every one of you knows that song because you heard it enough that you can remember it with great detail. And so here tonight, I, 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 I looked forward and I began to study and look at what Paul was saying here. And in this passage, he tells us to remember, but he also tells us that there are times where there is a war of words and there are many that go down as a consequence of those words. In our public discourse, in the news, in politics, in our workplace, and often enough, if we're honest with each other, our homes have descended from a place of understanding concepts of words and thoughts to a place where these those words, those Concepts and thoughts are mangled into nothingness. And it's not inconsequential, the words that are used there. Instead of thinking about concepts and, and so forth, we get so tied up in words that the whole conversation gets lost as to the purpose of it and the value of it, and it descends into a place where it's just a discussion about nothing. Anybody want to admit you've ever you've been in that sort of situation? You're trying to communicate, and everybody wants to argue on whether or not it's tomato instead of tomato. Anybody ever been in that sort of situation where you get to where you're arguing about what the words are supposed to sound like and arguing over what they mean? It's a problem, and it's big in our society today. Words, because words mean things. Words mean things, they mean specific things, and when those words are manipulated, often because of situational interaction or favoring a concept and swaying a conversation one way or the other, it is, of course, one thing to do so in casual conversation, but an altogether different one of speaking of and to the eternal word of God. It's in the Chinese culture that they have a a word that speaks to what Paul is saying here tonight. And y'all know that I don't speak English well, and I certainly can't speak Chinese well, but I'm going to give this one a whirl and see if I can figure this one out. It's from the Tang Dynasty of ancient times till the Queen, the final years of the Queen Dynasty, that a form of capital punishment was used. It was set aside. Uh, apart from the rest, for the from the rest, for a particularly cruel and brutal practice of killing someone, the ancient Chinese torturing a uh, torture tactic known as Ling Chi, which translates loosely as slow slicing or the lingering death, or the death as we would know it by a thousand cuts, was used as a method of of execution 
from the 7th century until 1905 when it was officially outlawed. It was and is a gruesome way to die. And it was legal until 1905. And literally the way that they killed someone was they would make small cuts in their skin until they literally bled out. If you can imagine this, those that are nurses knows how long that would actually take by a thousand cuts. And they would continue to cut you until there was no life left in you. And so... Paul begins to speak to us here tonight, not in a physical sense of a death of a thousand cuts, but it is the death of a thousand qualifications that gets us. See, often whenever we have truth spoken to us, we'll begin to try to qualify those things, or perhaps those that you live with love and so forth, they'll begin to try to qualify those concepts to where in the end they don't apply to us, they don't apply to me, they don't apply to anyone else because of the death of a thousand cuts. It's like whenever a concept is introduced from scripture, you hear things like this, but it was just cultural in their day and doesn't have anything to do with today. Anybody ever heard that sort of thing. Oh, uh, there are things about our walk with God that are qualified out of existence that are necessary to salvation. In, in, in some ways, they would say, well, Jesus was not really resurrected. He just swooned. And there they wrapped him up and put him in the tomb. And there he found himself with such a light pulse that he really didn't die. He just fainted to the point where nobody could tell that he was alive. And so they take away the resurrection. Paul says, let me tell you, everything that we do is built on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is in our lives a... A, a, a something that begins to rise in us and it begins to uh, try to take the things that apply in our situation and begins to try to say, that doesn't belong to me because my situation is different. It, it, it's It's... Over and over. It, it, it's not just in church, but it's in our workplaces. It's in our homes, if we're honest. It's in our school. It's in our things that we walk through in life. And so Paul switches, though, the focus on Timothy that he's had that applies to us in a, a secondary way. But then he refocuses the lens in the scripture on the church in this passage. He says this. Of these things keep them in remembrance. One of the most potent guards against a faulty memory is repetition. Paul used the song of the church, that song of reward that we learned about last week as a method of remembering in the verse prior. When something is set to music, memory increases greatly in retention and also access in it to, you, uh, to it in your mind. In that ancient world, in fact, in that ancient world, in the, including the ancient Jewish people, they were given to memorization of Scripture. It was most notable, though, that once the word had been given to Moses, that the first order of, of business to make sure that it stayed true to itself, uh, that they would develop a very defined way of copying it from one to another to another to another. And it was that there were a group of men that arose, and it was a good it was a good thing initially. And they were called scribes, and they would write the law uh, on new parchment so that it could be passed down. Uh, and, and with a particular focus on them practicing what the word said, Moses, though, in a prophetic word, if you'll turn with me to Deuteronomy the seventeenth chapter, Deuteronomy chapter seventeen. I'd like for you to go there in your Bibles here tonight, and uh, I'm glad I'm in a church where I hear the pages turning. I, I have uh, 
me copy on my 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 <coughs> device, but I love to hear the pages turn in the house of God. Deuteronomy chapter 17. Moses begins to speak a prophetic word. And he speaks a prophetic word because he's given the law. They're in the Sinai, and he's looking forward to the time where they will have a land that flows with milk and honey. He speaks, though, whenever they get there, that they will not be ruled like they are with Moses and, and Joshua, but they will be ruled by kings. And he says this in Deuteronomy 17, 18, and it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, speaking of the king that has been set up there, he sh that he shall write him a copy of, of this law in a book out of that which is before the priest of the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and to keep all the words of this law and the statutes, and to do them. I'd like to go back to verse uh, seven, uh, 18, rather, when it says, And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write. In order to be a king, you had to write your copy of the Word of God. You had to have the handwritten Word in that you had written out your own self. You had to carry that Word with you. Do you know why you had to write it? So that you would remember it. So that you could recall it. Do you know why that you had to read, write it and recall it and, and live with it every day? Because situations that you face... Are governed by what you writ, what was written for you, and you wrote down again because there's going to come a time where there's going to be tough situations that you are going to face in your life. And if you look to your own self, you will fall, you will falter, you will sin if you do not look at what the word says and say, This is what the word says about where I am. And it may be hard for me to have to walk through, but I'm not working on memory because I know what the word of God said. David, I think, would say it like this. I have hidden thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And see, it is there that the king was to have a copy that he himself had written with his own hand, something usually reserved for the scribe. It was of such great importance that it was to be written laboriously by the king instead of these men to whom had been given the function of copying the word. I remember uh, whenever I began to study this, my, my brother has a great collection of pens. He has a great collection of books, but he has a great collection of pens. And, and my brother some time ago would go and he had a, every week I, he had a, at a time where he would take notebooks and he would literally take and copy the word of God from the psalm in that he would take his Bible and lay it there and he would write out the word of God word for word in a notebook because he felt like it was important for him to write that word so that he would have it there and he's got notebook after notebook with these things in it. But, but the king uh, was to have this copy that he had made himself. You see, the king had heard the word over and over in his life as a son of the law, but it wasn't good enough. Instead, God did not want a king to whom would try to recall the applicable passage, but instead would have written it at least once and also had that copy with him at all times to draw for from with the situations of the kingdom, even in the promised land. That's important. This was for when they were in the promised land. Because difficult times were going to come even in their promised land. Difficult situations were going to come in their promised land. Anybody want to give a witness that just because you got the Holy Ghost, the difficult times just don't go away? The difficult situations that you find yourself in don't just disappear because you get the Holy Ghost. Or is that just me? Amen. Difficult seasons come to your life. And you need the stabilizing hand of God's written word in your life. You see, I, I need you to understand exactly what's going on. Whenever this king had to write his own copy of the word and carry it with him and read it from him. 
Because often what we have failed in our minds to grasp is that though the anointing breaks the yoke, that you can be anointed and yet you have to have an authority in your life that is greater than the anointing that you have placed on it at, at one point or the other in your life. You must have an authority greater than your anointing. And thus it was that the kings of Israel in the promised land and there where the milk and the honey are flowing, everything is as is, is good as it's ever been for them. And yet the Lord says, your anointing is not enough. Your anointing is not enough. Your anointing is not enough. You've got to have the word because there's going to come times where that anointing is going to, you're going to, you're going to be fooling yourself and thinking that the anointing that you're walking in is, is, is his. And you've got to discover that it is the word that is our stabilizing force in our lives because there is no way for us if we're not careful, we will find ourselves, as the Bible says, uh, either excusing or, or ourselves or, or, or others. And so whenever they walked into the promised land, the word was necessary to keep the kingdom in that great place of blessing. Milk and honey may flow, but the word was the stabilizer of the promise. And not the production of the land. Never, ever think that God's provision is the stabilizer in your life. The word is the stabilizer. And so the kings were to consult that word that they had written. It was to be one of the things that they kept on them at all times. And they were to apply that word without fear nor favor. If you recall, Solomon is in the in the promised land, and a woman comes to him and says uh, that, that their baby, you remember the story of the baby, and he says, let me slice it in half. And you're like, no, Solomon, don't do that. That was not a wisdom of his own. It was a wisdom that was given from God because he revealed who the mother of that child was. You see, they were to secure the blessing of the promised land by staying close to the word. It had to be ever on them and before them. Why? Because forgetting is normal. Remembering is not, but forgetting is. And can I go a one step further? All right, I feel, I'm feeling comfortable now. Maybe this is such a good thing. Here goes. Y'all ready? We forget the things that we all remember. And we remember the things that we all forget. We'll deal with this in just a moment, okay? But, but, but we, we remember the things that we all leave behind. And we, 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 for, well, we forget the things that we should leave behind us. And we don't remember the things that we ought to carry with us. Paul said, look, forgetting those things which are behind me, I press toward the mark of the high calling that is in Christ Jesus. It is crucial that we remember the right things. And so it is that Paul steps forth and begins to speak with great conviction and in that imperative sense to Timothy that is to be transferred to the congregation. He says, remind them, Timothy, remind them of truth. Remind them of the gospel. Remind them of the resurrection. And Timothy... Keep on reminding them. Don't just do it once. Make it a song. Remind them on the left. Remind them on the rock, right. Make doctrine central to all that you do as leadership in that congregation. Make doctrine central to what they do in their lives, how they live their lives, how they live out the gospel in their lives. Remind them of a song that we sang. Remind them that suffering is not a sign of divine displeasure in your life, but rather a part of their walk with God. Remind them that they are different from the world and that false teachers are not of this world. Remind them that these things were paid for by blood of the most precious blood lamb that has ever walked on the face of the earth. Our lives have got to be reminded of what he did for us because it is only in his blood that we're about to be saved. You see, in essence, 
Remind them that there is a great difference between the church and the world. And don't get those two things mixed up. Remind them that there is a great difference between what they are and what they were. Remind them that there is a great difference in the promise of heaven and the knowledge that hell is real as well. Remind them that there is something powerful that can be partake, taken of in their life if they will simply let themselves be led by the Spirit and by the Word. Paul's language and his use of word pictures uh, moves us to a far greater understanding of the seriousness of these reminders. In this next phrasing, there is a moving from the language of earth to the language of heaven and the hall of justice in that place when he says charging them before the Lord. In one translation, it's rendered solemnly charged them in the presence of God which emphasizes the place in, what, in, in which what is to be followed is sealed. Here, the reminder and the reminded have been moved to a solemn warning. Paul has already spoken a solemn warning in first, and to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.21, if you'll turn with me there. 1 Timothy 5.21, because it is there that he has solemnly told Timothy uh, a warning and, and I'd like for you to know that there is importance in those solemn warnings of what Timothy was supposed to do. He said this in 1 Timothy 5, 21. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without referring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. It is a solemn, solemn Solemn thing to be charged before God to not have partiality in your life and depend on situational ideas of how things are to be handled. In the courtroom of God, which is exactly where we are tonight, and in the there in the presence of Jesus Christ and those angels, Paul calls Timothy in 1 Timothy 5, he calls them calls Timothy the serious personal charge. Don't be partial to the rendering of judgment toward those in church because it is serious judge of business. Don't withhold judgment because of financial contribution, he tells us. Don't withhold uh, judgment because of personal likes and dislikes. Don't hold, withhold judgment based on family or on gender, he says. Just don't be partial. Let the word speak in situations and let God be God. Be diligent, he says to Timothy. And with this, it matters because the soul matters all. We'll hear this same charge, solemn charge, in that same courtroom that he spoke of in 1 Timothy 5. And also here tonight, whenever we get this, the fourth chapter of this same book that we're in. Because he said there in 2 Timothy 4 and 1, I charge thee therefore before God. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. It is so important that we understand that the charge he is putting here is in the courtroom of heaven. We are going to get to that passage in, in the fourth chapter. But for this night and for this text that we took, it is the saints that Paul has in view. He says, remind them of truth. It is your solemn duty to do so because heaven is that important and the blood is that valuable. The, Paul, the language that Paul uses means to have an emphatic verbal admonition. Or as we'd say it, be Pentecostal about it. Be emphatic with it. Tell them the truth. Tell them that this is the way that it is. It has to be told with force, with power, and with conviction. It is of importance that we understand the context of these words, a charge before the Lord. This charge invokes 
legal language that has a threefold purpose. It, whenever he says a charge there, it is the attestation to a statement or a swearing on God's behalf of truth. It involves not only swearing with your mouth, but an attitude uh, toward what he, God is speaking of and also the actions that that causes. I am adjuring, I am swearing before God that I'm going to speak it, that I'm going to think it, and that I'm going to do it in my life. That's what he said. In other words, Paul covers the mouth, the mind, and the way we act here See, Paul tells Timothy that he has those three things at the center of his thoughts and his purpose. And then we get to the central part of what Paul was saying here in this passage. Uh, he spent some time writing our minds for, the, for two things. The next scripture, which, by the way, is one of the most famous passages in, of, of it all. Most people can quote John 3.16, and they've heard this one, the next Weeks lesson. Study to show thyself approved. A workman. And he is not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. That's next week. But Paul said, I'm, I need to frame something for you here before you get there. I, I, need you, I need you to know something about what I'm going to say before I say what I'm going to say. He, he said that that's the next scripture. That's number one. But I've got to tell you before you get there. That there's a killing, there's killing effects in the war of words. He said to make sure they strive not about words to no profit, but subvert, but subverting, but to the subverting of the hearers. Because Paul has positioned Timothy in the courtroom of heaven, both by the charge before God. The object of this verse naturally gives us some form to understand in a modern sense of what Paul is about to say. We're in the courtroom of heaven, right? That's where Paul is. Paul has drugged Timothy. He's in a prison in Rome, and Timothy's in Ephesus. And he said, son, I need you to come with me to heaven because we're going to stand in front of God for a few moments here in the justice hall of heaven, and I need to talk to you about something that's going to be important for the church and for your life. He says this. He said, he said look, he said, that make sure that they, this church does not strive about words with no profit because those things kill people that hear it. And see, it's clear that there were many false teachers in and around the church at Ephesus. We've seen that in the in, in 1 Timothy. But it was also clear that there was an impulse within the church to use those words of life in a way that was clearly not what they were meant to be used for. We've already seen this when Paul spoke of the athlete. If you're going to win, you're going to have to do it by following the rules. Not using the rules, but following the rules. You see, you, you, you can't use the rules against their purpose. You can't use the rules against other people. You can't do that. That's not the way that the word works. It's not for you to use the word in a way that's favorable to your cause and not apply it in, in a way that's, that, that, that touches your life as well. See, uh, we're not looking, though, at the, at the athlete. We're not looking at the farmer. We're not looking at the soldier. But rather, we're in a courtroom. And we know that our modern term for this would be an attorney or a lawyer. And, and, and we're going to leave that for a moment and come back to it. Paul, though, as we can see, has confirmed that our current war, war of words in our public sphere is nothing new. It's nothing new actually inside of the church. And can I please submit to you that whenever it gets to be in your home, it begins to have the same sort of destruction that it has and can have inside of the church as well. You see, constantly redefining words or using things in ways that they were never meant to be used is at the crux of this because in the words and in the arguments, the words, even the word of truth gets destroyed in those that it was meant to save. How does it do so? The literal translation of quarrel is word battles or a war of words. You see, in these word battles, these war of words, the object is not to bring truth, but power to whoever wins the battle. 
Paul says it like this in the ESV translation. Not quarrel about words which does no good but only ruins the hearers. At the same time that Timothy was charged to keep reminding the Ephesians about the faithful sayings. He was also to warn them uh, before God against quarreling about words or literally word fights. Word fights can seem so intellectual. Anybody ever been in a word fight or been around a word fight where the folks sounded so intellectual and you're like, they done been educated past their intelligence. Anybody ever been in that sort of situation where you're like, my word. I don't know if they even know what that word means, but they sure enough just used it, okay? And that's where you begin to, 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 to know. But, but inside of the church and inside of our homes, it can foster and does foster a theological discussion which is, in the end, uh, purely verbal, having nothing to do with the realities of our walk with God. Word fights are the feast of dilettantes, and so it is a place where they begin to try to puff themselves up with what they think the word says. Paul has already addressed this in the first epistle, so we can know that it was an ongoing situation and problem in the Ephesian church, and it should be understood that it also touches our lives as well. Paul had described for us the ruin that comes with, with, with fighting over words earlier in his first letter to Timothy when he said, that the one who teaches false doctrine has an unhealthy interest in controversies and argument. And by the way, an argument is the same thing as a word quarrel or a, word, a war of words. That's what he was saying. That's how it translates it in a different place. He says that re result in envy, quarreling, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of corrupt mind. So you think that none of the church would teach false doctrine, correct? That's what you think. Nobody teaches false doctrine that goes to church, right? That's not how it works, right? And it should be so identifiable that it was easily eliminated, right? And yet, Paul brings it back one more time. And, and the question is, well, Paul, in the first time that you said it, you said it was false teachers. But this time, Paul... You're talking to the church about it, not the false teachers, not to those things, but you're talking to the church about it. How does this play out in our lives? Why would Paul say such a thing to the church? Because there's a difference in the two occurrences in the letters. Paul in the first epistle identifies exactly from whence these things come, false teachers within that church, but yet in these words, that we read here for our text tonight in the second epistle. There is no other identification of where these words are coming from other than the church. What the false teachers had started some 10 years before, this is, this is important for us to understand. What the false teachers had started 10 years before in Ephesus, had been rooted to a large degree out of the church. But the residual effect of those teachers was that it had become characteristic in the church itself. No, it was not false teachers, but it was people who were twisting words and not applying truth. You see, it was killing them in the church when he wrote this letter by the same thing that was creating in their lives by the false teachers themselves. It was causing envy, quarreling, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction that caused a perpetual ruin and conflict that caused you see, death in a particularly deadly way, by the way, it removed them from the faith. It's important for us to understand exactly what Paul was talking about here. Because Paul was not just saying this from no basis of his own. He had heard Timothy, whenever Timothy wrote letters to explain what was going on in that church, he was, he was talking to them and 
And yet, he, he said, look, he said, I'm not going to include the evil teachers from the last time, but it's gotten inside of the church itself, and the spirit of that is circulating around, not only in the church, but surely in the homes as well. But he, you've got to understand that this arguing over words was as ancient nearly as the earth itself was. Because in Genesis chapter 3, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, in a place of perfectness, there was a war of words. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 3 says this. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, and neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. You see how the war of words had happened there? It was a war over the word die. Now God had said, If you eat of it, you're going to die. Satan said, nah, you're not going to die. You'll be good. Because there was a redefining or try, attempt to redefine the word of what death meant. And to be honest with you, Satan won that day. Because what was God's idea of death? God's idea of death was spiritual separation from him. That is the most horrendous thing that you will ever have in your life. And this is why Paul said it destroys the hearers of what is being said. It leads them to a place where they spiritually die. Satan's idea of death was physical death. And God plays a and does place a far greater weight on the spiritual condition than he does of the physical one. And God was and is and always will be right. It was the original word fight. And as I said, Satan won. There is much more here than we give credits to, by the way. It's, it's here that 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 the Jewish way of thinking. In the Jewish mind, Lucifer has a whole different place than he has in our minds because Lucifer, Satan, we always perceive him as the one that's the tempter of our lives, and he is. But the Jewish mind has a whole different way of understanding what Lucifer is. In fact, in their minds, he is the district attorney of heaven. He is the one that brings the charges against them. In fact, whenever you hear terms inside of Scripture that he has sit down on the right hand of the Father on high, that is a legal definition of our counselor, the wonderful counselor, the one that comes down and pleads our case before him and applies the blood to our lives. And yet we have Lucifer here uh, in the same courtroom uh, there, he is what we would call a lawyer. Now, if there's any lawyers in the house tonight, with all due respect, I, I'm going to have to take the task a little bit. Because here in this place, what Satan was doing in the garden was a term that we have, that we commonly use. He was lawyering the language. Anybody knows, know what that is? Lawyering it up. Just taking the words, the ideas, and, oh, it's legal. It may not be ethical. It may not be right. But it's legal. And so that's what we're going to do. This is why it's so important that we had the discussion a few weeks ago about the farmer and, and the, the athlete and the, and the soldier because it tells us the same story. And see, there. Uh, Satan's first action that we know of in earth is to lawyer the language and he did so and humanity failed in a perfect place. It brings to mention or brings to, to uh, remembrance that in the promised land the king had to write the word and keep it with him all the time. See, 
It, 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 Paul had watched the long effects of false doctrine in the church. The false doctrine had been rooted out, but its effects, its longest lasting effects, were in the arguing over words and word meanings. And see, we'll see next week, there's a strong indicator of how this happens within the church itself, but it is in the place where the word is spoken out of context and ignorantly used in a way that is not right. It bears repeating. It brings with it a great number of issues, controversy, arguments that further produce children of hell. These children are envy, quarreling, malicious talk, evil suspicion, and constant friction. How does this introduce itself, though, in our lives? When we lawyer the language to fit what we want in a situation. How does this introduce itself in our lives and live in our lives? When we use the word without studying it, without knowing it, without carefully examining our lives in comparison to its dictates. And can I please help everybody in this house tonight? It starts in your mind. Because we want to justify ourselves and our actions. Anybody with me on that? You want to be you want to justify yourself? Anybody want to be honest with me tonight and say that that's where you find yourself? And so I'll use the word of God to justify my actions when I know for a surety that that's not at all what God had ever intended for me to do. See, we 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 have such an impulse to justify what we want over what God wants and how God wants it. And, and when we lawyer the language and we use the word in a way that just somehow we begin to structure things that, that make our sin okay and we begin to structure things in a way that makes our, our failures to be successes and our and our and our and the things and our victories that are in the flesh somehow to be spiritual and somehow whenever we begin to take these things in our lives and all of a sudden we have changed the image of God into the image of flesh and we become self idolatrous because of what we want instead of what God wants we begin to get a hold of what's in in our lives and say God I'm going to justify myself by the by the word that you wrote that is so very different than what I am doing in my life and yet I want to be I want to be justified in God I'm not only do I want to be justified but I also want to be in my life I want to have the support of your word to do what I want to do and yet God says you shall not have those things because not what you're what you're doing is not only killing yourself but you're killing everybody that is walking and hearing and seeing and doing what you're doing it is killing those people with his spiritual death because they begin to uh, advocate and do the things that you're doing and begin to justify themselves in the same way that you justified yourself and the Lord the whole time stands there and says not with my blood not with the things that I have done not with the sacrifice that I made not with the stripes that I bore not with the things that I've come to you in my life with and to cover you and yet we begin to law your language to try to make ourselves right. And Paul begins to tell us, oh no, oh no, the blood's too, worth too much. The kingdom of God is too, it is too precious. The word that he delivered that the price of his body is far too great for you to sit and try to justify your actions by the things that you are trying to pick and choose from in the word of God. Can I tell somebody there's a word, there's a spirit of the Lord moving in this house tonight that tells us that there should never be a time where we begin to look at ourselves and say, God, I'm going to justify my actions by your word. Because when we begin to learn the language, it begins to change from the image of the one that wrote it into a gospel that is our own. And can I please tell you, a gospel that we write of our own will die because our blood is not sufficient to cover the sin. starts in your mind. You've got
got to be convinced that the Lord's way is the only way. You've got to be convinced that His way will never be a cross purpose with itself. His love is never in contradiction to His word. That is the lesson that Paul has immediately before called us to before we got to this passage. He is faithful to his word whether we have been, whether it was in our favor or it is not in our favor. Because obedience is the only solution to the situation in our lives even when it's difficult. Why? Why? Because God absolutely knows the best and the only way. There's hope. There is hope. Because he has told us when we walk through those passages in our lives. When we walk through those troubled times in our lives. Where it is difficult. That he will not send something that is so consuming that it destroys us and his blood can't lift us. It takes a great deal of discipline to face the things, the words, the things of God. How do we start? Well, there's a demand in the Bible for our yeas to be yeas and our nays to be nays. In fact, it says this in Matthew 5, 37. But let your communication be yea and nay, nay. Uh, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. That is, that whenever you begin to try to, you begin to try to, slide the language and shape the, 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 the narrative, shape the decisions and shape all of those things. The Bible clearly says this, that that's where evil comes in your life. You've got to let your yay be yay and your nays be nay. Be clear about what's going on. Don't try to shape it. Don't try to move it. This use of language by Jesus, by the way, by the way, this use of language in Matthew 5.37 is spoken of in heavenly terms or, if you will, in the courtroom of heaven. The, the repetition of this to Timothy was within the reach of the church. Secondly, not only must our words be firm and not working a situation for our, but they also must not be used to work a situation for our own comfort and purpose when the conflict is with the word of God. Third, we must be committed to the word to the degree that obedience is the answer to the, every situation and unflinching obedience, a commitment to his word. Fourth, the, uh, the word for strive not is splitting hairs. In other words, trying to divide the word to such a degree that it finds favorable meaning or use for yourself or your side of the situation. Fifth, the end result of these words ought to catch us hard because he says the word ruins the hearer's that is a damning thing. We get our word catastrophe from this. The word ruins is the same word that we get catastrophe. <coughs> it may be a character trait. I don't know. It may have been learned. I don't know. It may be a way of pulling people to your side. I don't know. But know this. That it causes spiritual death. Paul says that the continual exposure to this sort of arguing is deadly even to those who are not participating in it. Passive listening is to these things bring the same death to the user that already has come out of the speaker's mouth and life. There are some arguments you, 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 you lose simply by entering them even if it's by never saying a word. It has subtle interests, interests in your life told you at the beginning of this tonight that the Chinese had this gruesome way of killing lean sheep. They begin to cut small cuts. They begin to cut. And it, 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 it was slow. It was painful. Just enough to get the 
the nerves under the skin and the blood that began to flow. But, but it was interesting how they started this. See, they would begin, the executioner would begin to administer cuts to the bare flesh. He would start at the chest where the breast and the surrounding muscles were methodically removed until the bare ribs were almost visible. And then the executioner would make his way over to the arms, cutting away large portions of flesh and exposing tissue in an excruciating bloodbath before moving down to the thighs, where he would repeat the process. See, he knew the place to start. Uh, the process of this death of a thousand cuts was near your heart. Because if they can get to your heart, they can destroy your legs, and they can destroy your arms, and they can destroy your walk. We don't have death by a thousand cuts, but we do have death by a thousand qualifications. We qualify things out of existence, the existence by lowering the language. We create so many reasons why the word doesn't apply in this situation nor in that situation until it has no application in any situation. And most often, it's the what starts in our hearts ends by literally cutting our feet completely out from under us. Why? Because Proverbs 23 and 7. For he, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. As I conclude here tonight, it's important to understand a couple of things. This verse is the reason for the next one. One of the most famous in Scripture. Secondly, the pervasiveness of this thing and, and the, the, the urge to do this is still amongst us. It happens in homes. It happens in relationships. It happens in churches. And I would, as Paul instructed Timothy to do when he told him to strongly admonish you tonight, to not play word games in your life. How does this work out? Well, by not seeking things to make things right for you and twisting by uh, twisting word definition or, or constructing situations so that they're okay for you in your life for the sake of many things, for the sake of having your way, for the sake of your position on the matter, for the sake of your preferences, for the sake of your own comfort. It's exactly what Paul was speaking to us earlier. If you're going to win, it's going to be by playing by the rules. See, in our lives, God has placed, in all, every one of us, God has placed people to assure us that we don't issue, so that we don't issue death sentences in our lives. There's a role within the home of a spiritual authority. There's a spiritual gift given to the church for five-fold ministry, which the role of pastor and teacher is crucial. Brother, you don't have to wait and worry that his way will work. It has. It will. And it will always do that. It may be difficult, but again, Paul told us that suffering is part of this. Folks, I want to tell you this one more time and give you assurance. That his way is always right. It's right every single time. And I'm thankful that the Bible tells me that he is graceful to forgive us our sins if we'll just ask. He is that sort of God. He'll cover us with his blood. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that whenever we begin to look and understand that there is a God who cares enough for us to tell us the truth, to speak to us in our lives and to walk in a way that we can understand and that we can walk behind them. I'm thankful for the comfort of the Holy Ghost, for the power of His Spirit in our lives, and I'm thankful for Him pulling us through the tough times. I'm thankful that we serve that sort of God. Why don't we stand across the congregation? I think it would be appropriate here tonight if we all begin to pray and ask God to touch our lives. God, thank you, Lord, for all that you've done here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the power of your mighty hand. God, thank you, Lord Jesus, for blessing and keeping us, oh, Lord. God, I ask you to forgive me, oh, God. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to touch my life. 
Oh, God, I pray, Lord, that I would live my life by your dictates, God, and your word. God, I thank you, Lord, for the grace and mercy that you've shown to me, oh, God. Lord, I call on it again, oh, Lord, to touch me, Lord, and to move, Lord Jesus, in my, in my life. God, I pray that you would touch every person that's in this sanctuary tonight, oh, God. I pray, Lord, that you, Lord, would begin to deal with them, Lord Jesus, about the situations, Lord Jesus, in their lives, oh, God. I pray that your hand, Lord, Lord Jesus would begin to move, Lord, and that we would be submissive, oh God, to your will and your purpose. Oh God, I pray tonight, God, that Lord Jesus, you would move, Lord, in a mighty way, God, and that you, Lord Jesus, would be our help in trouble times, oh God, and that you, Lord, would be our provider, Lord Jesus, when we don't have. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would come to us, oh God, and that, Lord, you would begin to move, Lord, in this congregation and let, God, your glory be in this house, oh Lord. I pray, God, that our words, oh Lord, would be established in truth, oh God, and that, Lord Jesus, they would not be in destruction of others, God, creating catastrophe in other people's lives, oh God. I pray tonight, Lord, that your mighty hand would move and that you, Lord, would do a great work through us, oh God. I pray, Lord Jesus, for strength, God. I pray, Lord Jesus, for power, Lord. I pray, Lord Jesus, for an overcoming touch, God, of your glory. God, I give you praise tonight, Lord, for all that you've done and all that you are and all that you're going to be, oh God. Lord Jesus, I give you praise tonight for all that you've done, Lord. Help us, God, in our walk with you, oh Lord. Help us, oh God, to walk closer and nearer to you, God, and to be submissive to your will, oh God. Lord, I praise you, Lord, for your power and your love, and I give you glory and honor, oh Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your strength in our lives, God. Even when we're weak, oh God, you said you would be strong, oh God. Lift us, God. Lift us, oh Lord Jesus. Lift us, oh God, in our time of trouble. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done and all that you are, God. In your precious and holy name, I pray tonight, God. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your power and your love in our lives, oh God. Thank you, God, for your strength and your perfectness, oh God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the glory, oh God. Thank you, Lord, for helping us, oh God. Lord Jesus, I pray, God, that your hand, Lord, would stretch forth, God, and change, Lord, situations in this congregation. Change lives, oh God. Lord Jesus, make whole, oh God. Lord Jesus, I ask you to set a right, God. I pray tonight, God, that we would forget the right things, oh God, and that, Lord Jesus, we, Lord Jesus, would, would forget, Lord Jesus, the wrong things, oh God. I pray that, Lord Jesus, we remember those things, God, that are you, Lord, and forget, Lord, those things that are behind us, oh God, and press towards you, oh God. Lord, I pray tonight that your mighty hand would move and that your spirit, Lord, would have free reign in our lives, oh God. Lord, Jesus, release us, God, from bondage, oh God, of our own 
own selves, oh God. Release us, God, from bondage, Lord, of lies that we've told ourselves, oh God. Release us, God, from justification, God, of things, Lord, that we've done and we're doing, oh God. I, I praise you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy to us, oh God. I worship you tonight, God, and I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done, and I appreciate your deliverance, God, in my life, oh God. And I ask you to move in this house tonight, God. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, Lord, and your precious, your precious name I pray. Amen. 